can start. One, two, one, two. Okay. So, hi everyone. I'm going to introduce you to um, a tool for researchers uh, to free your papers. But first of all, um, what is a researcher exactly? Um, the systematic investigation into a study of materials and sources to establish facts and reach new conclusions. This is kind of confusing. So what is exactly a paper? So who was there at the cleanout on the gravitational waves? OK, so uh, we could say this is really a breakthrough, what was discovered on this day. And naturally, there was a paper published for it. So we can all take a look to the full text here, which is filled out scientific details and mathematics formula. But what do we do with papers? Well, researchers read them to inform themselves on what's going on in their field. Or people who read their thesis with, that, with them. We could also, as developers, use them to read software, for instance, machine learning systems, or databases. But there is a catch. Um, research is financed from public money and published through companies like Elsevier or organizations like ACM or IEE. And this publisher decide to keep the papers behind a paywall, so you have to pay for it. So this is kind of closed source. But uh, it creates problem. Well, students can access those papers because, because their school pays for a subscription. But we would like to have open access. Open access is really important because over, over people we are not students cannot access to the paper and have to pay a ridiculous amount of money for only 10 pages, which is not, which is not really fair. So it's time for the guest game. And who, people who are students in this room cannot play, unfortunately. So publisher edit journals, and those journals contain papers we have to, to access. In order to access their content, we have to pay subscription for it. And mm, the most famous one is Nature. And in your opinion, how much do we pay for a subscription per year for only one journal? Is, does anyone have an opinion? 50,000. 50, no, too much. So, so sorry? Too low. So we pay over 10,000 per year. And you can also have journals picking at over $25,000 per year. This is insane. But what is really interesting is how much they, may, may, they make a profit. So according to Right to Research, Elsevier has around 31.7% of profit margin, which is what? Which is what? So let's compare it to a big company. What was Google approximate profit margin in 2008? Anyone idea? Well, 30.6%, which is less than the publisher. OK. So let's summarize, some, let's summarize all of this. So researchers keep up with the state of their findings in their field. They have new insight and ideas by reading this paper and understand them. So um, they read down these ideas into a new paper, and then they submit it to a publisher. There is a system which called peer reviewing, which tries to filter out which content could be considered as scientifically correct and as a breakthrough. Finally, if the paper is accepted, our science has progressed. But in fact, there is a third party which we often forget, which is the publisher. And publisher gets money every time at each process. But there is a problem. Why this is important that publishers don't gain too money from that? Because we have subscriptions which are becoming more and more expensive. Like you said, like you've seen, the price is really high. And the fact that we are giving away our research for free for the reason of peer reviewing it makes them more profitable. So why shouldn't also students from developing countries have access to these crucial papers which are behind the paywall? Because they don't have the money to pay for it? And why cannot people who are not students but maybe developers or any kind of field cannot access these papers? Because they're not students? 
they don't have universities to pay for this subscription? Well, this could be you if you are a developer and you cannot access papers. You could run into, you could run into a situation where you, ne you need them, but they're not available. So what can we do to improve open access? Well, uh, we created this, I mean, which is a tool to give control back to researcher. And we would like to promote an open, a global open access policy with it. So how do we do that? We fetch your papers from different sources. Dublin Core, Bayes, all kinds of repositories, we fetch them. And we check the policies on these papers. Can we open them? Can, can't we open them? Can we, can we open only the preprint version? And then we tell you what you can deposit legally. So what, is, what does it look like? Well, this. This is, uh, where, this is a page where you can deposit a paper. So you can see what you can deposit and what you can't deposit. And you, this is pretty simple for a researcher to actually open their papers. When it's done, your paper is free and accessible by everyone. So this is great, but to give you more insight, who is behind this amine? This amine was an initiative from a group of students of the Ecole Normale Supérieure in France. We are a non-profit organization participating in many open access related projects. We worked with Wikipedia to, for an open access board. Uh, we will be uh, at the OpenCon. So um, maybe you are telling yourself, but this is a Python talk. Where is Python in this story? Well, this is, of course, written in Python using the Django framework. So we're using PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL to store papers and their metadata. data. So we're encountering some challenges I wanted to share with you. First of all, the papers. We have more than five, 15 millions of metadata of papers, and we are still getting more and more metadata for new sources. Uh, but we have a problem. How do you fit this amount of data in your store? Well, we kept PostgreSQL, and we used its powerful JSON field. So PostgreSQL and JSON field. Well, implementing JSON field in a model is just a matter of importing a model and use it in your model, which is really awesome. But what is awesome is how PostgreSQL handles them. Well, you have indexing for free, which works on soft fields. This is super efficient and can be your NoSQL word for a while if you don't want to buffer. You could avoid very complex join, and you can access subfields in queries directly without having to fetch the whole record. So JSON field in PostgreSQL is really a good solution when you don't want to implement a NoSQL store. The second challenge is we need to have search, and it has to be fast so that our researcher can can get more feedback really easily. So we tried to keep PostgreSQL for this kind of task. We looked in its search engines, but it was not sufficient for the amount of data we had. So we entered Haystack. Haystack is a Python library for Django to provide awesome search tools. First of all, multi backends. So we can have Elasticsearch, Solar, Woosh, Xapian. Even we can use them. We can like configure a master elastic search with a backup solar, which is really cool. We have face setting. We have real time indexing, which is important when we're getting new papers. We want them to be indexed right away. And we're still working to make this faster because it's really hard how to maintain all, all this metadata coming from many sources. And the third challenge is the most hardest, in my opinion how to prevent duplicate papers, because we have so many sources which provide slight variation in the metadata, metadata so that uh, we need to have a solution for that. So we tried a fingerprinting technique. We have a function which takes a paper and re reduces it to its minimal form, remove the diacritics, re lowercase everything, we sort the author's list, we simplify the title, and finally, we compute a hash on it and store it. Then, if we have a similar thing we're printing our database, we can just merge the paper and get more, more, and more metadata, metadata on the paper. So this technique works, is working more or less, but we always have uh, some cases where we don't have the title because some sources don't require you to enter a title for a paper, which is absurd. Anyway, 
um, to close on the challenges, uh, we have many more challenges around machine learning to disambiguate authors' names, uh, perform title cleaning from LaTeX markup, infrastructure script. We have already Vagrant for development, but we would like to get Ansible or anything to push in production in a more efficient way. Uh, we would like more deposit interfaces and sources to support more universities and more use cases. And how GitHub rep repository is filled with interesting issues, and we need your help. So, to close also on open access, we have many projects uh, around this domain, like a proxy for digital object identity, an open access bot for Wikipedia, a crawler, a crawlers for repositories, um, an OAE PMH protocol implementation, which is a protocol to fetch papers in an efficient way, and um, a bit of inspiration from um, another lightning talk which uh, has been done by Lassie from the Koala team. Um, I want you to do something at the, end of the, uh, at the end of this talk, which is, if you're a developer interested in open source, clone this semin, run it using background or anything, try it out and deposit fake papers for fun, take an issue and submit a pull request if you can. And if anything goes wrong, blame us. And if you're a researcher interested in open access, you could talk about this semin to every one of your peers, you, per, you could pursue them to open their papers, because this is really important. And most of all, you should own, open your own papers if you have them. And if anything goes wrong, complain to us also. So thank you uh, for this talk. And thank you, Python. It was really a great, talk, uh, great conference. If you have anything, you can contact us. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any questions? Hi. So I'm interested in how you are funding yourself because uh, I would imagine that going uh, against uh, companies like Elsevier, Springer, and so on isn't a trivial task, uh, especially for a couple of students. Um, so like we said, we're, we are a non-profit organization. Um, we receive some donations, uh, but we don't have so many costs. So we don't have um, we don't have the need for a lot of founding. We're going to get some founding from um, repositories in France, uh, AL, which is Archive Ouverte. Um, but uh, to be honest, we don't really need we don't really that need uh, founding. So. We don't have problem going against uh, Elsevier or Springer. Does that answer your question? Welcome. Um, you think of um, storing the paper on already open storage for them, like Archivix or All in France? So uh, why did you choose to store that in your database? Um, so. As far as I know, RX EV uh, is only a store for preprints, right? Not for. F Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So uh, we offer the possibility to store preprint, postprint, and published version. Uh, the thing is also, uh, I don't know if RX EV and those kind of repository um, supports. Uh, the way we are fetching the policies so we can tell you what you can deposit or not. Right. So uh, we think we are trying to to get also papers from IXEV and other repositories, so we are trying to unify uh, all repositories. We are not storing anything. We just use Zenodo, which is another repository uh, financed by the CERN. Uh, so we think we are different. Um, hi, me again. I would be interested in uh, your faculty position on that because um, it seems, that, you know, in the research business there are multiple problems where scientists are complaining. Uh, that's one of them. So I'm more interested in are you iterating with the, uh, your faculty or do you set your goals and priorities by yourself inside the student group? 
Uh, so your so question is about how do we prioritize uh, what we do? So if you are working with your faculty, with professors, assistants, and so on, or if this is just your student project? Um, uh, so I'm not really a student, but half of the uh, contributors uh, in the discipline group are students. We have, um, I think, a professor now. Um, the prioritization is based on uh, what are the use cases of universities and what do they need to make their, uh, their use case, uh, to make their repository better, uh, and also how can we promote in a, if, a more efficient way the open access. So uh, you could say this is my student project in the sense that I work on it because I find it really interesting, but uh, for other people, it's really important and crucial, and I understand that. So we are trying to, pre to prioritize uh, some issue in our issue tracker. Um, but if you have real, a really huge use case and you, are, you really need it, just send, uh, send us an email and we will talk with you to see how we can make this happen. Uh, hi, great talk. Uh, what I would like to know more maybe about how how do you handle the duplications on on the on the, uh, the do you use only the title for the fingerprint or no no um, so um, for the duplication problem uh, we're we're using a lot more data um, I don't have the the algorithm in my head but I I'm pretty sure we're using the um, the title the authors list we're trying to sort it so that this is a deterministic sorting. Um, we are trying to simplify uh, all uh, data which could be uh, removed by one repository but keep, uh, kept on another repository. Uh, uh, to be honest, has this is open source, I can suggest you only to take a look to it. And I can give you the file after. Why did you um, decide to build something new rather than use an existing open access tool such as DSpace, ePrints, or Fedora Commons? For, for using what? Sorry. <clears throat> uh, for using an existing tool like DSpace, which has been around for about a decade. Um, so I'm not really aware of what DSpace does exactly, but someone um, already asked himself the question. So uh, I think we found a lot of flows into, in this space, uh, which we didn't really want to keep. So it's the same reason for where whenever you create a new tool, it's because the other one is not sufficient at some point, we think. Any other questions? Let's say I'm a researcher and I put the final version of one of my paper, but don't, I don't have the right to do it. Um, are you taking a legal risk because you are hosting it or not? Well, we have a term, um, our terms of con and conditions uh, specifies that you must be the you you must have the right to depose the paper uh, on the website. Yeah, but let's say I don't care about the limitation and I just do it because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, so uh, I don't know if this really happened before, but if it, it would happen, uh, we won't be able to detect it automatically or find it ourselves. So until we get an email from someone saying to us, oh, you're hosting a paper which should not be on your, uh, which, should not, which should not be open, and we would have maybe assess and desist later on anything like that, and we would remove the paper. Fortunately. Anybody else? So, thank you, Ryan, for your talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>